Are your step one or step two scores stuck and you're not sure why? Don't worry, you're not alone, and it doesn't mean you're dumb. The secret to success is to first know exactly what our problem is before we start looking for solutions. Antibiotics are a great treatment for pneumonia, but a horrible treatment for heart failure. If your studying isn't working, it may be that your plan is solving the wrong problem. As someone who scored in the top 0.1% on step one, I've created the SCORE framework to help you identify and overcome your obstacles no matter where you're starting from. We've had students use it to go from the bottom 3% to the top 3%, some in under two months. Because remember, it's not what you got, it's how you use it. Let's dive in. So the SCORE component is comprised of five parts. S stands for study concepts, not memorization. C is to commit to memory. O is optimize application. R is repeat. And E is execute analytically. With this framework, what you can do is, is understand exactly where you are in the framework to understand why your score is stuck and how to fix it. Let's start with study concepts, not memorization. As we've talked about before, the NBME, which is the National Board of Medical Examiners, the people that write step one and step two, they are testing concepts. They're testing your ability to apply concepts and to use them appropriately. As we've discussed in the past, one of the most important things that you're going to be tested on and one of the biggest differences for step one and shelf exams and step two is that these exams are testing your ability to apply concepts. So let me repeat this because this is probably the most important thing that you're gonna hear about studying for the US MLEs is that it's not like the memorization test that you've typically had. So when I went to Stanford for medical school, the professors tended to write questions that you could just memorize where they would kind of you know scour their PowerPoints to find things that they could test you on that they could pull out and they could put on the exam. And so what med students are typically trained to do up until they take step one and shelf exams is that they're typically trained to just memorize things. This does not fly for step one, step two, or shelf exams. And so for people that are struggling to pass, the biggest problem that they have is that they're just trying to memorize things and regurgitate it, which is A, not very efficient, and B, not adapted to the way that they're asking questions. And so one of the ways in which we assess whether someone is mastering the concepts as opposed to just memorizing details is that we'll look at their flashcards. So let's take an example of say pulses paradoxus. If you are memorizing it, your flashcards might look something like this. Pulses paradoxus, what is it? Pulses paradoxus, what are the causes? Or maybe even pulses paradoxus, what is the pathophysiology? Note that the answer to these questions could be pretty straightforward and there's something that you could regurgitate from a relatively small flashcard. Now let's look at someone who's made a really excellent flashcard that puts together not only the pathophysiology, but also the causes because they made sense of it. They've mastered an underlying concept. So what this person said is, pulses paradoxus, use the pathophysiology to explain the causes. And then they went and then they described what it is. So it's greater than a 10 millimeter mercury drop in systolic blood pressure during inspiration. And then they also took the next step, which is remarkable. So let's, let's look at this. So they said, on inspiration, you have an increase in venous return, which means you're gonna have an increase in right ventricular preload. And basically what happens is, is that anything that's gonna compress the heart from the outside and prevent ventricular filling, so something like say croup or OSA or asthma or COPD, right? Some sort of obstructive pulmonary disease where the lungs are gonna get uh, air trapping and over full and push in on that heart or something like tamponade where there's gonna be fluid outside of the heart that's gonna push in on the heart. Any of those things is going to basically prevent the left ventricle from filling, which is gonna restrict the left ventricular preload, which is gonna decrease the stroke volume, which is going to lead to that decrease in pulse pressure because every single time the ventricle is contracting, there's gonna be less blood pumped out, which means that the, the increase in blood pressure that you see between the diastolic and the systolic is gonna be less. You can tell from this card that this person really understands this concept and any way in which they're going to be asked this, they're going to have a very good chance of answering it. Contrast that with the other flashcards where you've got you know, just the simple things like what is it? Or what are the causes? Or what's the pathophysiology? If you're not asked those specific questions close to that specific way, it's gonna be much more difficult for you to get those questions correct because it, you don't really understand the concept if you're just memorizing the details. And so again, if you're struggling to pass, one of the biggest problems that we see is that you're not going deep enough with the concepts. And so this is rule number one one, two, and three for people that are struggling to pass. If you love active learning rather than tedious memorization, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons so you can master more in less time. C stands for commit to memory. And so once you've learned something well, the key is, is to never forget it. 
I cannot emphasize this enough. One of the most life-changing things that I've learned in my entire career is that if you learn something once and you never forget it, and you can continue to learn new things and add and grow your foundation, there are so many things that are going to get easier for you throughout your career, and it's only gonna get better. And so note that I put retention after the studying concepts, not before. And so this is really, really important because a lot of people get these steps mixed up. They think, oh, I have a problem with retention, and so I'm gonna go and use some pre-made Anki deck, and I'm just gonna memorize all of the facts in it because it's comprehensive. Always optimize application. So two of the most common things that we hear from students when they're reading questions and they're struggling with getting questions correct is A, I get stuck between two answer choices and I always choose the wrong one. B, I will study something, I'll know it really well, and then I'll get a question wrong on it. And then I'll read the answer explanation after I've gotten it wrong and realize that I knew most, if not all of the information in the explanation, but yet I still got it wrong. The reason behind this is that they're having a hard time seeing the concepts behind it. So I'll give you an example of a question about this where someone thought, oh my gosh, this is such a random detail. I knew everything there is to know about this condition, but I just happened to not know that one detail. And so the question was something like, you know, what would you see on an echocardiogram when someone has a massive PE? Now note that this came from a step one bank of questions where it would be really, really difficult for someone to understand it if they were just in their first or second year of medical school. And so you've got two choices when you look at a question like this. You might think, on the surface that, hey, this is a really, really specific detail that I just need to memorize, right? You've got a massive PE, you've got an echocardiogram finding, like you just have to memorize that thing. Or you could look for the concept behind it and try to figure out which concept this is really getting at. If you really look at the concept, it's actually pretty simple. The massive PE conceptually actually is just representing an increase in afterload. Peel back all the layers, really the question is asking you, what would you see in the heart if you had a massive increase in afterload? Now, if you're able to see this conceptually, imagine how much easier this question would be to answer once you're learning things well, once you're never forgetting it is, when you're doing questions, you wanna always ask yourself, what concept are they testing me on? And try to simplify that question so that you can understand the concept behind it. So the next step is R, which is repeat. And you should do this lots. So note up until this point, I haven't talked at all about how many QBank questions you're doing or how many pages for first aid and there's a very specific reason. The reason is, is that if you do more of the wrong thing, it's not going to solve your problem. However, once you've proven that your approach is working, then repeating it a lot more is gonna make a big difference. So let me explain what I mean. I think one of the most natural things that you can do if you're trying to improve your score is to look at people who've done well on their test and look at what they did and try to copy it. Because the, the assumption would be, oh, okay, if I just do what they did, then I must be able to improve my score. The problem is, is that for people that have really high scores, oftentimes the kinds of problems that they're trying to solve are different from the kinds of problems that you may be trying to solve if you're not quite there yet. An example of this would be, so I scored in the top 0.1% on step one. The last month or two before my exam, I was doing tons and tons of QBank questions. The reason I was able to do that was basically because I had the first three letters of the score framework down pat. So I was studying conceptually, I had already committed it to memory for basically a year and a half up until that point, and I could optimize my application, right? So I already had those skills. And so for me, the next thing that I had to do was to make sure that I just did a lot of it and just increase the number of questions that I was doing and increase the number of things that I was learning to help fill in the gaps. So if you're doing 40 questions, maybe you do 60. If you're doing 60 questions in a day, maybe you do 80, right? And try to keep pushing it so that you can learn and master more things in a day. Because once you found something that's working, then the key step is to make sure that you just do a lot more of it. The final step is to execute analytically. Now in sports, just as in studying, champions are ultimately defined by their execution. And so to score really high in step one or step two, you need to think about your execution and specifically you wanna execute analytically. So the way to think about this is sort of like Moneyball or being a professional card counter. And so what do I mean by that? It's interesting to note that it only takes about four to 5% on one of the step one or step two NBMEs to increase your score by about 10 points on the three digit score. And so it's actually not that big of a difference, right? So in other words, on step two, if I wanted to increase my score by 10 points on NBME 12, I would only need to get about 4% more questions correct. This is important because really what you need to ask yourself is, okay, what can I do to increase the likelihood of getting a question correct by just four or 5% on my next NBME? The way to do this is to make sure that you find small different 
differences in probabilities on all of your questions. Because if you can do that, you can have really large impacts on the outcome. Let me give an example. In the NBA, in professional basketball, Steph Curry is considered one of, if not the greatest shooters of all time. What's interesting is, is that his three-point percentage is 44%. The average NBA player's three-point percentage is 36%. When I looked this up, I thought, oh my gosh, he's gonna have like a 50% shooting percentage, right? But in reality, it's actually only an absolute difference of 8%. In other words, he's figured out a way to just increase by small increments, right, his ability to get shots at a higher rate. And so for high USMLE scores, Yes, you have to master the content. Yes, you have to make sure that you never forget it. Yes, you have to learn how to apply it and do it a lot. Ultimately, if you really wanna get a high score, like 260s or above, the key is, is that you want to increase the systemic odds of getting every single question correct. Let's take a really simplified example of this. Let's say that you have a 10 question block and maybe two of them are really hard and you know a few of them are easy and then most of them are kind of medium. The hard ones, maybe you've got a 40% chance of getting them right. The easy ones, maybe you've got an 80% chance of getting them right. And the medium are maybe 60%. The goal is basically to increase your chances of getting a question correct for every single question, especially the easy and the medium difficulty questions. Right? Most of us, when we're studying, we tend to focus on the hardest questions because those are the ones that are, that are most challenging. And so we spend a disproportionate amount of time on the things that we don't know. However, look at the number of questions where, that you're getting wrong that you have the knowledge for. My guess is, is that if you're like most people, roughly half of the questions that you're missing, knowledge wasn't the critical limiting factor for you getting it wrong. Instead, there was something wrong about the way that you were approaching the question. So maybe you were reading too quickly and you were missing critical words. Or maybe you are getting, when you get stuck between two answer choices, maybe you're just not approaching it properly. Maybe you are expecting that the answer is gonna feel perfect. And so when that one thing doesn't make sense, you're throwing out the answer. The score framework is a game changer for anyone looking to boost their USMLE scores at any level. By studying conceptually, committing to memory, optimizing application, repeating and executing analytically, you'll be well on your way to dominating these challenging exams. However, having a solid framework is just one piece of the puzzle. Knowing how to effectively tackle the most critical step one resource, first aid, is equally important. That's why I encourage you to watch my next video, First Aid for Step 1 Top Mistakes, where I reveal the most common pitfalls students face when using this book and how to avoid them. Click the link and I'll see you on the next one.